Let's begin by telling you that the Kano State Chapter of the All Progressives Congress State Working Committee has, been suspended, has suspended ward party leaders who earlier suspended the national chairman of the party, Abdullahi Ganduje, from the party. The APC ward in Dakwintofa local government had suspended the party's national chairman, Ganduje, on Monday, but in a swift reaction, the party thwarted the suspension and sacked those behind the suspension of Ganduje. The state party chairman, Inusa Dawanu, said those behind the suspension of Ganduje were caught in anti-party activities and their records of meetings with the opposition were exposed. The state working committee adopted the suspension of the ward's APC leaders. It, however, clarified that Ganduje's suspension is invalid, null and void, and cannot stand. The transmission company of Nigeria, TCN, says the national grid has been fully restored after Monday's fire incident at the Afem power generating station in River State. TCN General Manager of Public Affairs, Cindy Dimba, stated in Abuja that the fire caused a partial disturbance of the grid. According to her, at about 2.41 a.m., a fire erupted at the Afem 533 KV bus bar coupler, leading to the tripping of two units, Afem 3 and Afem 6, resulting in a sudden loss of 25 megawatts and 305 megawatts respectively at the two units, destabilizing the grid and causing a partial collapse. Organized labor comprising the Nigerian Labor Congress and Trade Union Congress have submitted a fresh proposal to the federal government of Nigeria demanding 615,000 naira as a new minimum wage for workers in the country. According to a source who was a member of one of the subcommittees set up by the government to work on getting a new minimum wage for the country, the 615,000 naira monthly was reached after consultation by the NLC and TUC. President Bola Chinobu, through Vice President Kashim Shetima, had on 30th January set up a 37-member panel at the Council Chamber of the State House in Abuja, with its members cutting across federal and state governments, the private sector, and organized labor. The panel was tasked with recommending a new national minimum wage. Earlier, business and social policy analyst Kenneth Ikenwa joined us on this that um, the Nigerian Labour Congress, which I vehemently support, should look at the economic realities on ground and uh, play their own role in helping to redirect the ship, the, the alien economic ship of Nigeria, uh, into the right direction with proper perspectives. So um, it started with 200,000. At the point, it got to a million naira, and now it's back to 615,000. It is not economically pragmatic in as much as the Nigerian Labour Congress prides itself as a catalyst for macroeconomic populism. I do not think that this is realistic. We have looked at this uh, some time ago, and we have tried to set a tune or a target or a range, given the almost 200% increment in prices of goods and services and other things and amenities that Nigerians do enjoy, irrespective of the region. We would have thought, and I have advised that, at least the new minimum wage should range between 90,000 and 150,000. Let's also tell you that heightened security measures are in place across southwest Nigerian state in response to recent events as authorities have bolstered security around key government installations aiming to prevent any attempts to disrupt law and order by groups pushing their agendas. Security agencies have issued stern warnings emphasizing their resolve to clamp down any form of insecurity. The caution individuals claiming affiliation with the Yoruba Nation's agitation to choose a path of peace or face the consequences. This announcement comes after an alarming incident on Saturday where separatist Yoruba Nation agitators made an audacious attempt to seize the Oyo State Government Secretariat in Ibadan. Reports indicate that the agitators, dressed in army camouflage and armed with rifles, sought to raise their flag at the Oyo State House Assembly premises. However, swift action by security agencies led to the arrest of 20 individuals involved in the attempt. And joining me live to talk about this is a public affairs commentator, Jide Johnson. Good evening. Glad to have you join me. Pleasure to be with you. Let me start by asking your thoughts on Saturday's attempt to take over the Secretariat of Oyo State. I think um, the perpetrators of that act 
were ill-informed, ill-advised um, by whoever is responsible for recruiting them to embark on such an exercise that will end up putting them in jail forever if it does not lead to their lives being taken as a result of consequence of what we have in our, in our status and our law with respect to those that have committed treason and felony against, against the state. So as far as I'm concerned, they are, I just want to borrow a leave from what um, the former police commissioner of Lagos State um, said, Ocean, he said, probably um, these people were high on, on, on cheap drugs because no one in his right senses. Now, if you seize the secretariat, what next? That's the question that you need to ask. What next? What would be, okay, you raise the flag, you seize the secretariat, what next? What's the next level of action? You do have control of the Ohio state government. You have control of the military formation. So I think they are ill-advised, and I think that this particular issue should be, should be dealt with as quickly as possible. And those that are arrested should, should, be, should face the music, and the matter should be, should be treated urgently with a dispatch, and so that it serve as a deterrent for, for mothers from, from mm. carrying out such, such, act, such act that is meant to bring about the nation into chaos. Well, there are insinuations that this could be a secession move. Uh, could this secession be true? I mean, given that it was carried out by just a handful of poorly armed individuals who were swiftly contained by security agents. Now, the question you need to ask is that how are they able to even... Because for me, I've always said it, that security is about intelligence gathering. It's about prevention and not... Um, it's about taking proactive action. The, what level of intelligence do the security agencies in Ogun, in Oyo State excuse me have you have the police you have the DSS you have the NDDC you have various agencies of government in place and they were not able to intercept this before it happened that called to question the security architecture we have in Nigeria as a state and i think that beyond these people being made to face the music i think those that are in charge of security architecture in that state, both at the state level and the federal level, need to answer some questions. Because I can't imagine this happening. Like you pointed out, two, 20 ill-equipped, um, ill-informed people uh, were able to, 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 to penetrate the fences of your state House of Assembly and the state secretariat. It's, it's, it's not something that should happen where you have the security agencies on top of their game. But when such things happen, the next thing you see is that the security agencies and the top brass of the security agencies, they will appear before the media and they will say that we have everything, we are on top of the situation. You are not on top of the situation because there was an infraction. The infraction shouldn't even happen in the first, in the first, in the first instance. Now, talking about security, what signal does this send, not just for your state, but as a country as a whole, uh, when it comes to our security position, you know, as a country? Yeah, like I pointed it out, the security is about prevention. Security is about intelligence gathering. I think what we, in most cases, what we do is, 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 is to take reactive action rather than proactive actions. What measures do we put in place to gather intelligence? These people, are, they did not just, they didn't start planning that event on that Saturday. They must have planned that event. They must have organized. If you see some videos going on on social, there is a particular woman who, who released a, 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 a video saying that, well, this has come to stay, the urban nation, this is what they have been planning for, this is what they have been looking forward to. I think all this movement should, the security agents should be able to intercept this before it gets into the, into the public domain. Otherwise, you'll be, you'll be raising the tension within the larger society. Just to follow your line of thought, you talked about, you know, we having a reactive uh, measures to issues of insecurity, what would then be a proactive measure in a case like this? And the proactive measure is for the intelligence, intelligence community to have intercepted this. Probably these people, why they are, why they are planning stage, they, are make, they were making phone calls. They must have made phone calls. They must have done recruitment. They must have shared some intelligence amongst themselves. How are we not being able to intercept such so that we arrest them even before they carry out, uh, they carry out that, that, that act? It's an insult. I mean, it is an insult to the entire headship of the state 
and the federal security architecture we have in your state that under their noses that is happening. It shouldn't have happened. Now, let's talk about this issue of self-agitation for self, you know, a government. Why do you think we have such issue on the rise? Well, there is a need for us to have a conversation. There is no doubt about that. If you situate this with what happened with the hip hop, if you situate with some of the some of the use and cries we are getting from the north with respect to whether they are satisfied with the present political arrangement or not, you understand that we still need to have a conversation of what constitutes the Nigerian nation. What form and what type of government do we want to run? And how do we want to resolve that question of what makes you to be a Nigerian in moving in moving forward? Don't forget that one the Nigerian nation was was imposed on us by the colonialists, despite the fact that some of our leaders, pre-colonial leaders, participated with the Badon Conference, the, Lond the Badon Conference of 19, the London Conference of 1958, the Badon Conference of 1959, which led to the independence. However, however, over time, the military, uh, the military intervention in our politics has brought about the citizenry not having a say in what, for example, the 1999 Constitution is the Constitution of we the Nigerians. And we need to have that conversation. There is a need. We can't move away from the issue of what type of structure of government do we want to have? What type of system of government do we want to have? Do we want to run a parliamentary system of government? What form of representation do we want to have? We are running away from it. The, the longer we run away from it, the, the more the reality done on us that this issue, until you answer that question, I can tell you, these agitations will, 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 be, will, will be on and on. There is no amount of rotation of presidency either to the northwest, back to the southwest, or back to the southeast that can solve that problem. Because we have not even resolved the Nigerian nation question. What makes us to be a Nigerian? Is it a constitution imposed on us by, by virtue of the military transiting to, to civilian administration in 1999? Or is it a conversation that Nigerian willingly participated in the process to say that, okay, this is the constitution that we presented before Nigeria, and through a referendum, or plebiscite. Nigerians said, okay, we have ratified this constitution, this should be the constitution which we need to move forward. Moving forward, I think we need to have a referendum and I think we need to have a plebiscite. Well, that's the most we can take on the news. Thank you so much for your insights. GD Johnson, public affairs commentator, thank you once again. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for staying with us. About 10 years ago, 276 schoolgirls were abducted from a government secondary school in Chibok, a town in Boronu State, Nigeria. While some of the girls escaped captivity on their own, others were released following intense campaigning efforts from different governmental and non-governmental organizations. While in Atta one girls remain in captivity, there are more than 1,400 children who have been abducted in subsequent attacks. Our correspondent Bettina Onwili has details. On the night of the 14th of April 2014, 276 female students aged 16 to 18 were kidnapped by the Islamic terrorist group Boko Haram from the government secondary school in the town of Chibok in Borno State, Nigeria. Ten years later, some of the girls are still yet to regain freedom from their captors. Some survivors of the incident have indicated their displeasure are the fact that some of their mates are yet to come home. My biggest wish is for government to do, to do, to work hard to bring out my sisters. It's only my sisters I want right now. For some of my colleagues that are still in captivity, they should stay still, they should stay strong, they should help God. One day, one time, they will be released like us too. Almost three years. All of us in tears because of the girls. Every night I do kneel down and hold her picture on prayers. Uh, after the release of comfort, I still keep, I was um, grateful and I was happy. But the happiness is not all that full because of the remaining of her colleagues. Till today, about 82. Uh, nowhere to be found. Nigerian activist Yemisi Ransom Kuti has emphasized the need for state policing, saying it would help address some security challenges. However, 
Sources say that 18 of these girls have been killed, bringing the number down to 73 still in captivity. Demand for state police, which will be a, pre a, a, a preventive measure for future uh, occurrences. We want the police to be closer to the, the citizenry, to be able to police their communities effectively because they come from those areas and they are part and parcel of the communities. Those that have come back, and Grace Dauda, who is here, mentioned it, that some of their colleagues have died. So they either saw them, either saw them being shot or they were part of the proceedings to bury them while they were in captivity. But the government has not formally acknowledged that. So as a movement, we always say all of them. Because until the government is, comes out to formally tell the parents that X person is not coming back, we will still keep demanding for all of them. One cannot begin to imagine how heart-wrenching it is for the family and friends of the Chippewa girls yet to be released. Abducted as kids, some have now become mothers and wives to their abductors. Nigerians want to see more effort being put into bringing the girls back home safely and even more effort to avoid a repeat occurrence in the country. In Lagos, for New Central, Bettina Nwili. In the meantime, members of the Chiba community in Boronu State, in northeastern Nigeria, have called for the return of all rescued Chibok schoolgirls still in the custody of the state government to their families. They accuse the Boronu state government of keeping the girls with repentant Boko Haram members and denying their families access to them. Idong Joseph reports. It's exactly 10 years since the sad and unfortunate kidnap of over 276 secondary schoolgirls from Chibok in Boronu state, northeast Nigeria. While about 194 girls have so far been rescued, with 82 still remaining in captivity, members of the Kibako community have expressed disappointment over government's inability to effect their rescue. Within this time, 48 parents have lost their lives, mostly due to heart conditions and other health-related reasons. Three parents have been killed in subsequent Boko Haram attacks in Chibok and have been victims of vitriolic campaigns aimed at dissuading us from pursuing the cause of our daughters. Many families from the community say they are yet to find closure and want the government to come out clean on those who they say they have information that have died in captivity. As witnessed and established by their classmates and friends, while in captivity. There's no dodging the bullet here. Two of the parents have since gotten the news of the passing of their daughters. They accused the Boronu state government of rehabilitating the rescued girls with the Boko Haram terrorists, urging them to reunite the girls with their families. They also called for the 2014 General Sabo Fact-Finding Committee report on the Chibok incident to be made public. We demand a formal rebuttal mm -hmm. and apology to all the families and the community at large for the illegal cohabitation encouraged by the Borno State government by calling the tourists their husbands. Immediately publish and disclose the facts and findings all investigation panel reports that have been carried out on the abduction of our Chibok girls. Community members here have accused the government of keeping the community under siege on the pretext of ensuring adequate security. And they say security operatives have continuously denied the public access to the community, a situation they find discomforting. In Abuja for New Central, I am Idonk Joseph. Still on Chiba girls' abduction, Residents of Chibok community have raised concern over the scarcity of clean water in the town as the town marks a decade since the tragic abduction of schoolgirls by Boko Haram insurgents. Our correspondent Umaru Kirawa, who transversed Chibok community, tells us more. Clean water has been a daily struggle for many families in Chibok town. Grace Dauda and her friends await their turn to use the hand pump 
to push out water to meet their needs and that of their children. Ruho kulle muke a gare su cibokan muna da masalar ruwa sosai yanzu mu da kanmu haka da muka zo tun da ziyara suna gida ma ba mu samu ruwa ko abinci ba mu iya mun yi ba idan an yi shi sai a tsaya hanya in an yi shi a tsaya hanya wanda ya lalace kuma ya kamata a gyara shi to ka gani shine abin da ake so to amma ba an ya lalace ma to ba a so a gyara kawai da Allah ta maimake mu kaga yanzu demnin yayi ku sai a gare idan ya gare dole sai dai a ringa tafiya mu ruwa a jiya dauka a kawo a cikin garin nan in ba haka ba ba zai yi ba anan garin idan ya kare nan kurin abun jin ka ma ba za ka samu da riwa wallahi the town of chibok has become symbolic not only for the tragedy it endured but also for the resilience and strength of its people aka ga pompon ma anan ini ana kwana akai kowani lokaci yana hana yara zuwa makaranta dun ba za ya yi musu abinci ba dabbobin ma har ba sai su samu jigi suna rami har wayan su ma suna mutuwa to ruwan nan muna in mun dai ba muna sai da 300 amma kuma muna samu ruwan nan da wala ini kullun ina samu dubu uku the government have provided hand pumps for the water boreholes in some areas although these initiatives have positively impacted the community the scale of the problem seems to require a broader systemic solution gaskiya zamana cibo yanzu ya kai shekara 60 kaga ben ta baga isheshero ba ina roko gumnati ko gumnati nigeria ko nan borno ko wani gumnati dai da kuma organizations dai in za su su taimaka su su yi mana ruwa sosai don mu samu ruwa isheshe a kowane lokaci a wannan kasa kenan daga nan har shafi yanzu za ga mutane kuma pump din pump guda daya ne nan nan da yake guda daya ne sai kuma can ba lalle ya ishe mu bane idan gwamnati za su ya taimaka mana gaskiya su taimaka mana muna bukatar ruwa na irin sosai the chibok community struggle for improved water supply is a reflection of their resilience in the face of adversity as they mark the 10 year anniversary of the abduction of over 200 of their girls though many have returned but dozens are still in the hands of the abductors they continue to push for a better future at least in having clean water in chibok for new central umori kirawa The news continues in West Africa where the US Agency for International Development you said says about 90% of pharmacies in Liberia are selling stolen medicine donated by aid organizations. You said mission director Jim Wright said such acts of fraud prevent Liberians from receiving donated essential medicines. Following the revelation, six Liberian civil groups have launched a nation national media campaign aimed at monitoring the distribution of aid and medical supplies and raising awareness that donated medicines are free and should not be sold. Rights called for increased accountability, including the prosecution of those guilty of stealing and selling donated health supplies. The Liberian authorities are yet to comment on this matter. Senegalese customs said on Monday they had intercepted more than a ton of cocaine in the southeast describing it as the largest ever cocaine haul on the land route in the West African nation. The Directorate General of Customs said that 1,137 kilograms of cocaine were seized on Sunday at the town of Kidira, valuing the shipment at more than 90 billion francs, that is about $146 million. The cocaine was concealed in packets and placed in bags, carefully hidden in the double bottom of a refrigerated lorry coming from an unnamed country bordering Senegal. Senegal borders Guinea, the Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, Mauritania and Mali, countries known to be transit zones for drug producing Latin America on their way to Europe. In Southern Africa, the president of Botswana Mogwetsi Masisi has threatened to send 20,000 elephants to Germany following the imposition of ban on trophy hunting by Germany. The import of trophy hunting for countries like Botswana and Namibia is significant to the economy as it brings earnings to the locals and also creates employment. Botswana is home to about 130,000 elephants, the largest in the world, followed by Zimbabwe. President Masisi said these species were not attended to can cause a great damage to property and also humans. Botswana has previously given its neighbor Angola about 8,000 in its efforts to bring down the population of elephants in the country. And to talk about this in detail is the head researcher 
at Elizabeth and Margaret Stealing Foundation, Megan Carr. Good evening from here. Glad to have you join me. Hi, good evening. Now, what are the potential, you know, implication of President Masisi's threat uh, to send about 20,000 elephants to Germany? I don't think he's really going to send 20,000 elephants to Germany. Uh, he said that in a heated argument uh, when Germany said it was unethical to um, trophy hunt elephant. And because there's a rising number of countries in the West that are changing their policies towards the import of trophy hunting, I think President Masisi is very frustrated. But then how does uh, the president, that's Masisi, view trophy hunting and also the impact it has on elephant population in Botswana? Well, there's, um, at the moment, there are 2 million people living in Botswana, which means that there's 15, elef there's 15 humans for every elephant. And if we um, lifted all the corridors that are being blocked, if we lift the blockade on these corridors, the elephants would move around without so much human elephant conflict. So we need to do, we need to look at that rather than try and trophy hunt elephant. Uh, let's talk about how sustainable levels can be. Uh, I'm talking about the population status of the elephants in Botswana. And then how does it compare to sustainability? you know, of these number of elephants in Botswana? If we look at Africa and how it used to be, there used to be far more elephants than, than what there are now. Um, and as I've just said, if we were able to lift all the fences that, that are blocking the elephants, they'd be able to move around um, Africa towards their water and their food more easily, and we could find ways to live harmoniously with them. Trophy hunting is not going to stop elephants um, in Africa. But then, talking about humans, is there a threat, you know, to humans there, uh, looking as they'll be competing for space in that area? Yeah, it's a very big country, and there's only 2 million people, as I've said. Um, and if you look at Namibia, and if you look at uh, Zimbabwe as well, I mean, we have to find other ways in which to save elephants. Elephants are incredibly important for our biological diversity. Africa's facing enormous challenges with um, climate change, the sixth mass, mass extinction, we should be finding other ways to, to make space for elephants so that they can move around Africa more freely and me, not interrupt communities. Mm, let me follow your line of thoughts about finding other ways to save elephants. What ways or measures would you recommend from your field of experience? Yeah, again, it is just really about the corridors because they need to get to food and water. That's their number one. Um, and and there's a scarcity of both of these substances because of, of, of climate change. So we have to learn how they're moving around. And there are many organizations that are studying this. And we need to work with those organizations. They need to work with the governments in Africa so that people are safe, that communities are safe. There are ways also to live harmoniously with elephants. Naturally, there are ways to do this. Trophy hunting is not the solution, in our opinion. Thank you so much for your time on the news. Megan Carr, head researcher at Elizabeth Margaret Sterling Foundation. Thank you once again. Thank you so much. In East Africa, six people were killed and several injured amidst fighting between Sudan's army and paramilitary rapid support forces in El Fasha in the fall, one year to the day since the war in Sudan began. The Sudan Doctors' Union said that the El Fasha Hospital had reported six deaths and 61 injuries following clashes between the army and the RSF. El Shafa in North, the fourth state, the last state capital not under RSF control in the vast region, had been a site of comparative stability and a key humanitarian refuge before violence broke out there too on Sunday. Fighting broke out on the 15th of April last year between Sudan's regular army headed by the country's de facto leader, Abdel Fattah al bon and the RSF paramilitaries of his former deputy and ally, Mohammed Hamdan Daglo. The UK Parliament resumed voting on the government's controversial Rwanda bill on Monday as MPs returns to the Commons. It comes as reports suggest the UK held talks with other countries, including Armenia, about replicating the scheme. The plan to send some asylum seekers to Rwanda has faced setbacks since it was first announced in April 2022. But legislation to declare Rwanda safe is likely to pass this week. 
with the government majority, meaning amendments made by pairs should be overturned. Internal government documents have also shown that Costa Rica and Ivory Coast have been considered as options for similar schemes if Rwanda proves successful. In solemn remembrance of the 30th anniversary of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, the Kubuka 30 commemoration, the Rwanda High Commissioner on, in South Africa is hosting the ceremony in Pretoria in honor of the lives lost and to reflect on Rwanda's journey of resilience and recovery. The ceremony included a series of activities, including keynote speeches from distinguished guests, testimonials procession from survivors, and tributes to remembrance of this important day in history. Our correspondent, Bongani Siziba, was at the commemoration and now reports. The host, Rwandan High Commissioner, a special event to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the Rwandan genocide. Foreign dignitaries, citizens and survivors gathered to pay their respect and show solidarity with the people of Rwanda. It is a time to reflect, to honor the memories of those lost. Every year we remember uh, the, the, the lives we lost. We comfort survivors. We pay tribute to the people who stopped the genocide, uh, who were actually brave young men and women uh, under the uh, Rwanda Patriotic Front, the forces of the Rwanda Patriotic Front, which were led by our current president, Kagame, that stopped the genocide when, when the whole world had actually turned their back on Rwanda. In remembrance of their own similar past, South Africa reaffirming Rwanda that such atrocities will never happen again. As we honor the memory of those who were lost, we reaffirm our commitment to ensuring that such a tragedy never happen again. We must confront the forces of hatred and division wherever they may arise and stand up for the value of tolerance, inclusion and respect for human dignity. Solemn reverence and unity from dignitaries. It's a very important uh, commemoration. It was a very important commemoration last week in Rwanda itself. Our former president took part in the commemoration. I think we all have a duty to make sure that these events never take place again. We, we are appreciating uh, all of the efforts which are been doing by uh, the, the Rwanda's government. And uh, we hope that uh, these kind of things we, we don't wish to see it uh, every, in, the future, in the future. We don't want to see it. As we have more to from survivors who share their stories and experiences during the genocide. A simple matter. It's not anything that people can take the way they want. Because if you don't do it, history can repeat itself. A solidarity message from the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres in his message and commitment to supporting Rwanda in all countries in their efforts to promote peace, reconciliation, and justice. On this solemn day of remembrance, let's pledge to stand as one against all forms of hatred and discrimination. Let's ensure that the acts of the acts that began on the 7th of April 1994 are never forgotten and never repeated. Anyway, end of quote. So, the Kubuku 30 commemoration is a reminder of the resilience and unity of Rwandan people and a promise to never forget the lessons of the past. In Pretoria, for News Central, Bongani Siziba. Heavy rains in recent days have caused significant flooding in several countries in southwestern Kenya. According to reports from the local authorities, over 500 homes have been damaged or destroyed by floodwaters, leaving thousands of people displaced from their homes. Our correspondent, Niyo Moni, has details. In a scene of devastation, homes submerged in communities displaced. Southwest Kenya grapples with the aftermath of torrential rains causing widespread flooding. The heavy rains have triggered overflowing rivers, leading to extensive flooding in several countries. The hardest hit areas include Homa Bay, Migori, Kishi, 
and Narok counties near Lake Victoria. For these communities, survivor hangs by a thread as they grapple with the aftermath of nature's fury. 2019, Local rescue teams have been assisting residents to evacuate from low-lying areas and help those whose homes were inundated with flood waters find temporary shelter. The flooding has also destroyed crops and livestock in the region threatening food security. Officials are concerned that additional rains forecast over the coming week could make the situation even worse by further swelling rivers and streams. We people have really suffered for the last six years. Every time it comes, like now, people have been displaced. Like as we are speaking right now, 162 households have been displaced. Currently, 95 are staying at Nyamasau Primary Schools. The rest, out of that 162, are temporarily seeking refuge from their kin. Long-term assistance will also be needed to help families rebuild after losing their homes and livelihoods. As rescue efforts continue, there are warnings for residents of the affected counties to remain a lot for updates on weather and floods condition. In Lagos for New Central, Ni Omani. Thank you for staying with us. Investors have continued to back pedal on the stock market, especially in the banking sector, on the back of the proposed recapitalization of banks announced late last month by the Central Bank of Nigeria. The risk of sentiment resulted in the loss of 633 billion naira as investors took profits from the banks. Consequently, the market capitalization of all listed equities fell to 57.87 trillion naira at the close of the holiday shortened week from 58.49 trillion naira in the previous week, representing a 1.1% decrease. Further analysis shows that activity level was also impacted by the shortened trading week as the total trading volume and value weakened by 69.2% week on week and 50.5% week on week to about 31.58 billion naira and 734.4 million units. And to talk about this in detail, I'm joined by a chartered accountant and financial analyst, Akin Fatunke. Good evening. Glad to have you join me. Thank you very much, Adebola. Good evening to Nigerians. All right. Now, let's talk about the factors you think are key in contributing to the decline in the stock market performance uh, due to Nigerian banks' recapitalization. Very simple. Um, the stock market is a risk hedging uh, kind of uh, market and you know management of change becomes an issue cautious optimism um, naturally there will be the risk of sentiments uh, by investors now this is just come to us uh, are you sure we're not going to be having dilution are you sure it is going to be real in 20 2005, 2015, uh, when uh, Soludo uh, came with around about the same process, you know, what is really going to happen? Are we going to be swallowed? And who is going to be who that will be looking at, at these banks? Are you sure my money um, is not going to, <laughs> I mean, just go like smoke? Also, uh, Admittedly, we must recognize that um, the, the week that had just come back um, has been shortened. It's been, you know, I mean, shortened trading week. 
Um, so we may not be able to really find out in reality the fact to um, whether if we had we didn't have the holidays and extended holidays, um, the value will not have shrunk by the 69.2 percent. Anyway, there is a sour mood in the market, um, cautious optimism. So we still expect this sour mood will continue for about one week or thereafter. And then we begin to see a rays of sun. I begin to see situations where the first year banks uh, will con constitute over 70% of the assets um, in that space. Uh, and revenue in that space, already making uh, arrangements for extraordinary general meetings, FBN Holding has done, uh, the GT Holding is, is doing, UBA is also doing. Mm. And investors are, are looking and are just watching and say, yeah, yes. I mean, with this kind of confidence, I expect mm. all things about, being involved. Yeah, just to in there, Mr. Fatou Nke, talking about investors, I mean, what signal does this send to them? And then what strategies can investors employ to mitigate losses such as these when we have a market turbulence? Again, I dare say that the losses might not be real, maybe latent. Uh, again, like I, I said, by the time confidence begins to swell in, I will begin to see um, more moves in the microeconomic sector of government um, investors are much more likely uh, um, to have a bit more of confidence and become a bit uh, more bullish. But in the meantime, um, I know some of the first year, uh, you know, banks are already talking about ordinary share issue, rice issue, private placements, uh, talking about merger and acquisition. And it, it is this corporate move that uh, the matadors will begin to look at and say, yeah, I think we can sift um, the boys from the men. And then you can then go for preference shares. Don't also forget that the, ma the, the market is, is bouncing from the monetary side. A good, uh, more than good news coming from um, uh, Dr. Cardoso and his group making sure that uh, at the end of the day, FX and, um, you know, foreign direct investment is coming in. And then, you know, uh, the rating agencies are priming. We need to wait to see some of the things that the rating agencies are going to be making. Mr. Fatin, I wish we had knowledge. more time. Apologies for butting in. I wish we had more time, Mr. Fatin. Okay, but thank you so much for your expertise on the news. Uh, Chartered accountant and financial analyst, financial analyst, Aki Fatunke. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. The sky is blue for Nigeria, and uh, I passed in that. Thank you. And that's all on the news at this hour. But before we go, let's take a look again at some of the major stories. Kano APC has sacked party's ward leaders for suspending national chairman. Transmission Company of Nigeria has restored national greed after a fire incident at Afam Power Station. We also told you that clash between Sudan's army and paramilitary forces have left at least six dead and 61 injured. Send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen and follow us on social media. We are at News Central TV. You can watch us live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times channel 274, Avo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Adebola Adeduba.